Hello, everybody. I'm Cherry Conran, and I'm with KRAS Kickers. And today I am in San Francisco at UCSF, and I am here with Kavan Shokat. And I have no cheat sheet. I have no notes other than like he's the dude that made you know made something undruggable druggable, and um, is resulted in finding a pocket, which doesn't sound incredibly glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there's a lot of idiots out there that are unable to find a pocket. Yeah, <laughs> but like, wow, like you're the man. And so you found a way to, to pocket the, the drugs. And um, and as a result of that, been able to um, find a, a G12C inhibitor and in uh which is saving lives, making a difference for people that have lung cancer that have colorectal cancer and have all the other KRAS cancers. And as things are starting to develop, it's looking like it's gonna be um, able to take that research and just keep propelling it down because you find one pocket, there's gotta be something else going on, right? Exactly. It's a slippery little devil, but I'm beyond yeah. tickle just to actually be here and um, be here. And I'm gonna show you guys here in a minute, I'm gonna turn my laptop around so you can see the amazing faces that are behind the scenes that are also here. And so if you guys are in your witness protection program over here, now's your time to put your brown bag over your bag, over your face, okay? But these are the folks that I, I'm here with and, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out just like give give away. Actually, how about if I just do an introduction? If we do that, that'll be even easier. Okay. I guess. Hi, my name is Josh. Okay. Nice All right. <laughs> I'm good, hey everyone, I'm Larry. Hey Larry. Okay. All right. We've got Wayne here. Okay. Hi everybody. My name is Wayne. Some of you may know me, and if not, uh, it's nice to meet you. Okay, and that is the Wayne that everybody sees in the Facebook group. That is um, one of the original. You were, I think, you were one oh, of the. the you went, yeah, he's OG K Res Kickers. I think he's one of the first five, probably, that was in there. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Xing Hen. I, I work in K Wan's lab. Nice to meet you. Okay. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wen Chi. Uh, yeah. I work in K Wan's lab. Hi, everyone. I'm Ian. I also work in K Wan's lab. I want you guys to get the sense that you're actually here with me, okay? Hi, I'm Natalia, and I'm a patient advocate for my mom who has stage four uh, colorectal cancer. You okay? Uh, hi, I'm Annie Dolores, and uh, I'm in the KRAS Kickers group. Hi, Eric. I see you over there eating. <laughs> hi, good morning. I'm Patrick. Working in K One's lab just for two days now. But it's been great. <laughs> They're not all. It's not always as glamorous. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jack. I've been working in K One's lab for six years. Okay. All right. Hang on. I got. I got to bear with me. This is probably be horrible on video, but that's okay because you guys need to get the sense of what this is like here. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm a grad student in K One's lab. I've also been here for almost six years. Hi, everyone. I'm Johannes, a postdoc in K1's lab, and it's great to meet you all. Okay, fantastic. All right, and I'm going to be wandering back around here. And so, um, and later on, hopefully that went pretty well. And um, later on, we'll be able to walk through a little bit and see what the actual lab looks like, where we make, where we, we, like, well, where you guys, <laughs> I'm not involved in it, where you guys make the magic happen. Okay, so. Want to give an introduction? You yeah. Know, talk to us a little bit. Definitely. Uh, let me see if I can. If you can't share from here, I'll let me know. I think it should work. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for. Oh, here, Terry, move this way. Or maybe I'll switch with you. Okay. Right. Well, Thanks everybody for joining. I, I was uh, had the pleasure of being on uh, one of the KRAS Kickers uh, meetings more than a year ago, I think, uh, and uh, it was fantastic to meet you all and meet uh, both patients and advocates. And I think we really, really appreciate the energy you put in. And I was blown away by the level of questions and depth of thinking. Uh, it is a complicated, cancer is a very complicated disease. 
uh, deep science and what we are after in my lab is discoveries that will make a difference in people's lives. And uh, so we um, we take a, a chemical approach to uh, to the disease. And that means when we find something, we hope it will become a drug. And as we, Terry mentioned, for the G12C, that has already been uh, realized. But we know there are other mutations. And from the very beginning, we were after all of those, uh, the G12V, the G12D. And the chemistry to go after that was not known. And now that's what we were trying to discover. And that's what we've been able to do. Um, this little intro is meant to explain kind of the long-term vision for the lab and for the therapies we hope to discover. Um, so, you know, when you all know, but I'll just kind of come at it from a very high level, when, when we start with a normal cell, uh, cancer is a genetic disease, so it picks up mutations, and then there's selection. So the first uh, kind of mutation that gets selected for is in a gene that can become an oncogene. And a little uh, amino acid change in the protein activates that protein. It doesn't send signals outside anymore. It just gets instructions from inside of the cell. And that turns on a pathway that regulates autonomous growth. And that is the first step in the cancer. But actually, we have many cells in our bodies that have that mutation, but they don't become a tumor. And that's because there is a program in the cell that senses oncogene-induced stress. So the stress by that one-point mutation. And that triggers something, uh, um, one representative of those is a tumor suppressor called P53, which is a, a, the sort of guardian of the genome. It senses when there's extra mutations and stress in the cell. And when P53 is alerted, it stops the cell from dividing. It makes proteins that block the cell cycle, and it sends those cells into uh, apoptosis or programmed cell death. That's great, and that's a, a place where the cell is under control. But that state of the cell is also subject to mutational stress, and those tumor suppressors themselves then get mutated, and they lose their function, and now the cell starts to grow again. Once the cell grows and grows and grows, it's it's kind of a hobbled cell. It's not a normal sort of faithful uh, uh, replicator of its DNA. So it keeps making mutants and randomly sort of tries new ways to grow faster. And luckily, there's a part of our immune system that was evolved probably to sense viruses, bacteria, but now it can sense the tumor cell because there's so many mutations in it. And this is a little bit of a, of a, of a the slide is a little bit small, but what it shows is that the proteins themselves are here. They are processed into little peptides that are shown here. And if the mutations that I've shown you here and here show up in the peptides, then they become sort of uh, presented but on this in the cell and presented on something called class one MHC. Class one MHC is the sort of way that the rest of the body, the immune system can tell what's inside of every cell in your body. And so if the mutation is there and you have a T cell that has a receptor that can see the difference, the red dot versus no red dot, then it will kill the cell. That's the basis of the breakthroughs in lung cancer that we know are the checkpoint therapies because those take the breaks off the T cell and let them kill. Okay. Can I so, ask you a question about of that? Of course. Okay, so like when we're looking at, um, those would be the people that would benefit from immunotherapy. And so the T cells, and we know that PDL1 is one of the things that they gauge. What is the PDL1 measuring in this area? Yeah, so PDL1 is a um, is a ligand on the tumor cell, and PD1 is the receptor on the T cell. Do I have that right or do I have it backwards? That's Wenchi. Wenchi, which way is 
<laughs> it is correct. Okay. PDL1 is on the tumor cell. Uh, and so when we, and that is going to signal to the T cell, which has PD1, and silence it. So when we have the drugs against PDL1 or PD1, it sort of takes the brakes off this cell cell interaction. Okay. So that's Keytruda. Uh, that's sort of those those kinds of drugs. We don't use the name those names. We use names like Pembrolizumab. We have to use like the oh um, the, yeah, the, the, generic. the generic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. Good. We get all sorts of trouble for that. Hold it. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so so now you know I if we if we look at these three arms of what cancer is using, we've been working a lot on inhibiting the oncogenes. KRAS, KRAS kickers. We think that there's a lot of opportunity to target and reactivate the tumor suppressors as well, like P53 or RB or other genes that are powerful anti-cancer genes in normal cells, but because of the mutations, they're lost. We want drugs that reactivate those. We have a lot of hope in that strategy. And then another approach is this immune uh, recognition of a tumor cell, you kind of get the idea, here's a step, here's a step, here's a step, here's a step, here's a step. Anything in biology that has like seven steps, it's going to be subject to a lot of chance of not working. So we've looked for places where tumors evade the immune system, and we're looking for ways to re-engage the immune system when the tumor is hiding. So many of the projects, the, the oncology projects in the lab, fall into those three categories, targeting new oncogenes, reactivating tumor suppressors, and re-engaging the immune system. Uh, and we think that if we can find therapies that are mutant-specific, like G12C, they will be very toler tolerated by patients, and we can combine them and we can get to a deeper response. So that's kind of the, the high war level. on cancer. Yeah. So this is the actual war that we've got building out. And when we're talking about like targeted therapies and stuff, that's, you know, how are we targeting it? Right. It's not just a one and done. And, you know, I, I you know, cancer has been through my family. I mean, we've all know people that have cancer. And so until you start thinking in terms of what it is that's strategic, Okay, and that's part of the strategy is being able to know the biomarkers and what it is, which way it is we're hitting it. Okay, can you like um, in in these slides kind of like explain how a, a pan ras works or? Yeah, yeah. So so you know this is showing the the glycine twelve position on KRAS, and and we know that in um, uh, different types of uh, of tissues, we get different amino acid changes. In lung, the most common is G12C. The next is G12D and V. In colon, it's sort of roughly equal. Uh, in pancreatic, it's mostly G12D, then V, then C. So what, uh, what our lab has focused on are drugs that make a covalent bond to the exact amino acid that the tumor has that no other cell in the body has. That's true, and that's going to be possible for the cysteine mutation, the serine mutation, the arginine mutation, and importantly, the aspartate mutation. And when you say those, those are the letters that you mean, like the G12D is the... Is the aspartate, right. G12D is the aspartate, G12C is the cysteine, G12S is the serine, G12R is the arginine. Yeah. It took me a long time to figure out that's really just secret code, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, okay. yes, 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 yeah. Um, and, and now, what Terry, you asked about like the pan RAS inhibitor, and that is a chance to plot, block all of the mutants. Now, the challenge there is there might be less tumor selectivity, but we're seeing a lot of, of promise there. So, so that is, um, that is, we're, 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 we're going, everybody works in KRAS, in companies, in labs, is going after every approach that is tractable. And we want to do the best science, do the best clinical trial, get the best drug. So every strategy that's possible is getting explored.
I would definitely say. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, definitely. Okay. And then, you know, when it comes to the, the science and breaking down the research, you know, um, can you explain why it's important to be able to have like easier comparisons, like so you can duplicate them as far as like, you know, why why you wouldn't just use a G12C inhibitor, for example, and somebody else and just try and see what happens? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, the, the chemistry that we're making is a sort of, you know, is a, is a lock and a key is the best analogy. And, you know, if you have a key that's a drug, then you have to have the right lock. If, if the lock is different, the key just won't work. So just trying in this category of drugs is not something that is likely to work. And there's almost no chance the patient would benefit. So it's not ethical to put them on the trial. But you know, we need to have more and more drugs. This year, those will go into the trials. So we hope that people with every mutation will have a trial they can, uh, uh, you know, qualify for. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's that's a big goal. That's going to start happening this year, but... You heard it this here first. Is the, <laughs> this, is the, this, is, this is what we've been waiting for. The, the wave of those drugs are hitting the clinic this year. Okay, well, hopefully this will be the, the RAS kick in the air, right? Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's difficult. Yes. Okay, I can, I can see I, my chat's blowing up over here. I'm going to just see if there's anything that I need to like address here because um, I, I don't like to turn over the camera really easily. Um, so how about my mutant k -Rash to be not only a driver, but a trigger too? I don't understand what that question means. Um, I think maybe that... You know, it's a driver, but it also stimulates the sort of other changes in the cell. It doesn't drive on its own. It it actually plays a part in a complex genetic, you know, mixture. Okay. Yeah, G13D, uh, I think that will work. Uh, um, you know, we, we were seeing a lot of progress on those fronts. Some of them are just in labs now. Some of them are in animal testing. Some of them are in late stage uh, toxicity testing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, the the CMIC uh, interaction will be a ERK. That's it. MIC is a very uh, pleiotropic transcription factor. Okay. You that break drives. that down just a little bit more. Yeah. So so MIC, MIC is something, <laughs> MIC is something that pleiotropic means does many, 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 many things. And it usually comes up late in tumors when the sort of all the other, I told I told you that tumor cell gathers mutations. It sort of is a is a not normal type of cell. So it's it's using all kinds of different programs than a normal cell does. One of those programs is the MIC transcription factor, and it turns on a lot of 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 sort of. Um, so does it kind of hijack it? Yeah, yeah. It it really. Um, it's one of the main oncogenes. It's one of the first ones that were discovered from viruses. And it is another undruggable um, protein. Uh, but people are going after it by targeting its uh, associated proteins, sort of its neighbors and friends, and taking those down, which will take the mic down. Okay, so we're taking down his neighborhoods of breasts. <laughs> yeah, we think of a yeah. cell as composed of neighborhoods of protein complexes that do jobs. And when one of those is the driver of the cancer. Right, and then that's that's part of how um, we use the terminology pathway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. And that's when we're talking in terms of like the pathway drugs, you know, um, you know, whether it's pairing something up with an EGFR resistor or, you know, inhibitor in addition to in different types of treatment. Yeah. Do you want to come? Yeah. We, we were, you know, when you do a genetic test of your tumor, you find all of the mutations that it has. And sometimes the mutations are in drivers that we have drugs for, like EGFR. Mm -hmm. Then it's a ready. Uh, plan to put somebody on an EGFR inhibitor. Sometimes it's in a protein we've never heard of that doesn't really, we don't know its function. Maybe that's just what's called a passenger mutation. It didn't really drive the tumor. It just accumulated uh, randomly. And sometimes it's a unknown 
function uh, that that we have to learn about. And so we we monitor that. We go after all of those things. Uh, and for our lab, we look for what we call tractability. That means a drug that can find traction on the target, find the pocket. Even though Terry, you made it sound so simple. <laughs> Way to totally just kill somebody's ego. <laughs> Any, you had a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the TP53 and I, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they did a sub-analysis that it made no difference. Yeah. Was that what you were expecting? No, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Okay, so just re repeat what she said so they can. Okay, so Amy said basically that when they gave patients with the KRAS G12C mutation, the KRAS G12C drug, and we saw the waterfall plot of patients uh, responded well and didn't respond so well. And then they grouped the patients according to whether they had a P53 mutation. So the secondary analysis, the P53 mutant tumors were spread out randomly. And I thought they would be in the less responsive. So that tells us what? What do you think? Well, uh, MD Anderson talks about TP53 and KRAS being a bad thing for liver mets okay. in terms of recurrence rates. So I'm trying to make that all fit together. And yeah. I'm like, I'm, yeah. It I'm, sounds like I'm, you need a shotgun approach. Yeah. Yeah, but a shotgun then brings in toxicity. So I, I think it probably says that there's, yet another, we, we think we need to find another way to subset. So there might be something in the P53s and there might be another discriminator that tells us why some P53s didn't respond well and some were okay. So there might be flavors of P53 mutations. There's eight sites of mutation on P53. So there's that. So or you could say if you have a co-mutation of T53 and KRAS, Really think about trials because it's it's it it might be really important to yeah. to tamp it down because but the subset cancer. didn't show that right so it it, it said I mean it wasn't worse it wasn't worse yeah, yeah that's that right. to me is that's, that's a good point that's working mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I don't know if you guys could hear that or not. What they were saying is that the, the P53 needs to be like, more analysis needs to be done to identify what is how come some are responding, some are not. What what seems to be the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And right now there's not a definitive answer as far as being able to um, like take a full on approach, right? There yeah. needs to be something more. Like you, when we started looking at K, when initially they looked at K-RAS yeah. and it was like, oh, they just thought this is this whole RAS thing. Yeah. Okay. And there are different RASs, NRAS, HRAS, and K-RAS and the K-RAS is different. And then you started looking at um, you know, the G12C, you know, just looking at the individual subtype as opposed to a whole big grouping. Yeah. So they're going to have to do something when it comes to TP53 and some of these others. As yeah. Well. yeah, the okay. first P53 activator uh, is in the clinic now. So that's for a Y220C mut mutant form of P53, which is about 2% of all cancer. It's about eight, it's, it's about 4% of the, the p53 group so yeah so Which, that's that's a that's like the first one that's the equivalent of the g12c drug for p53 so we're really watching that we're trying to leverage that it just seems that much more important for patients to know what their biomarkers are obviously people that are involved in this group you know seeing this video they're going to see the level of importance but it's not going to just be what's existing and actionable today yeah. because the science is coming along so quickly that um, whether it's for yourself or for your doctor, you need to know what else is coming so you can, you know, make a yeah. plan. It, it's yeah. just so strategic. You right. know, this is a war. The more understanding we have, the more chance we have to make a difference on it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I want to make sure to give the lab a chance well, so you guys to meet to. the graduate students and postdocs that no, do, don't think you guys are getting a easy that do all the work. Uh, this is a uh, really uh, great opportunity to 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 let you meet uh, the graduate students and postdocs and have them give you a minute or two about themselves and what project and maybe on the slide. Uh, 
uh, they can point out what step they're working on. There are other students in the lab and postdocs that work on neurodegeneration and Parkinson's disease, as well as uh, targeting viral uh, replication. Uh, so we don't just work on cancer. We, we work in sort of signaling and making drugs. So you might hear about other projects as well. Is that good? Too? Sure. Sounds so maybe good. run through and, okay, you know. Cool. So you guys want to just come up one at a time? Why yeah. you just like, you know, just, we'll start with you. He's like, he's, look, he's looking like a volunteer. here. He's like, whoa. <laughs> no, that's okay. No. Have a seat. Okay, just. Okay, and your name again is? Hi, I'm Johannes. I'm a postdoc in the lab. I've been here for one and a half years. Very excited uh, to, to meet you all. Thanks for coming and, and all the encouragement you bring to our research. You know, when we, when we sit in the lab, it's at night it's dark and, and do the research it's just it's just really great uh, you know to have this interaction it means a lot and um keba mentioned you know all the different mutations of of kras and one thing that i've been working on uh, with a with a great group of people in the lab with, with ziang and andrew um over this year is targeting g12r and G12R is not, you know, not one of the mo most abundant ones, if you just think about the percentage, but it's very clustered in pancreatic cancer, and about 15% or so of pancreatic cancer are driven by KRAS G12R. And so we were able to, to develop the first molecule um, that targets G12R, and it's sort of we're at the very beginnings um, of, of the development, um, and we hope, you know, with, with better drugs and scaffolds coming out that, that target the active form of KRAS, um, the GTP bound form that, that we can maybe use this warhead and improve this warhead to uh, bring bring something that targets KRAS G12R. Okay, what does the R stand for again? Uh, arginine. Okay, so yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, cool. And well, and you use the term warhead. Which I say, yeah. Yeah. So, so, like so maybe maybe you're familiar with the with the um, with the G twelve C targeting drugs. They're covalent, so they form a chemical bond with KRAS, and they stick with this chemical bond. They stick really tightly. That and that's actually a relatively new mode of therapy. So if you go back, you know, and, and, and people usually develop drugs that sort of went on the protein and went on and off and had sort of an equilibrium. And, and bound, but not really tightly. And, and these KRAS G12C drugs are covalent. They bind really tightly. And, and one big advantage of that is that they are very specific for G12C. Um, and so, but if we target other mutants, we have to swap out uh, the, the reactive group so that they don't react with a C, but in this case with an R. And so that's you know what we call the warhead is the part of the drug that reacts with with the respective mutant residue. Cool. Well, thank you for for coming up and telling us what you do, and keep doing what you need to do. You know, seriously, seriously. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you guys. How cool is this that we get to see and hear from you guys what it is that you're actually doing? Yeah. Okay. And look how young these kids are. <laughs> okay. And when I talk about like, you know, this is tomorrow's hope. Okay. I mean, like seriously, I mean, um, you guys really are the fresh faces and we need that kind of energy to do what it is that you do. I appreciate it. I feel really honored to get to talk to you all. This is really amazing, actually. Well, understand that we feel like it's a real thrill for us because I, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, but I mean, as somebody who wasn't, didn't have any exposure to like big colleges and big universities or research or anything, I mean, I kind of had always envisioned like a dark, creepy Batman sort of cave place that you guys played with mice and did, I don't even want to know, strange stuff to them. <laughs> and that's not what this is like at all. I mean, it, it, it's nice, it's bright. I mean, you guys, I mean, not one of you look creepy. I mean, like... <laughs> Uh, even though I know that there's mice. Well, that's because you're not here at 2 a.m. So you <laughs> <want to see. laughs> 
Yeah, apparently. Well, apparently. <laughs> True confessions. <laughs> so tell us what it is you do. Yeah, um, I'm Megan. I'm a graduate student in the lab. Um, and so kind of like, I guess people have sort of mentioned a little bit so far, a lot of these things are really hard to target. I know you made it sound really easy to find a pocket, but <laughs> no, I know. But when, you, but if, if, when you slim it all down, right. it's kind of like, well, who wasn't looking for a pocket? Right, exactly. <laughs> but it took people a while to find the one. In Four years. years. <laughs> Um, and so what I'm really interested in is that um, a lot of cancers, you know, are really dependent on being able to make all of these oncoproteins like KRAS and stuff in order to divide, right, and make more cells and have your tumor grow. And so the idea behind my project is that instead of targeting, you know, one specific thing like KRAS or P53 or BRAP or something, um, is to try to generally stop a lot of these oncoproteins from being made in the first place, right. right? So if you don't have more KRAS being made, you can't have more signaling coming from that telling the cell. So you're trying to, to stop divide. the hiccups before they happen. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm working on uh, basically a molecule that um, people have seen does this really cool thing where it stops those proteins from being made. It doesn't stop every protein being for from being made, but specifically a lot of those oncoproteins and some of the ones that are still really, really hard to target right now, like MYC and stuff, mm -hmm. but we like, don't really have that much for it. So are you identifying the um, different genetic components that are triggering this ahead of time? So you know which ones these are? Um, so the way this works, it's like a semi-specific kind of molecule, I guess. And so all of these different proteins um, are made, so you have your genome, right, with your DNA, and it encodes for all your proteins. And then that gets made into RNA, mm -hmm. which is the message that has the code for, okay, this is how you make the protein sequence. And so that RNA is basically read out by the ribosome in your cell. And as it's reading it, it will make that protein from it, right? And so what we have is a molecule that will stop your ribosome from making some of those proteins. And so as it's sort of like reading through that sequence for what the protein is, a lot of these oncoproteins have very similar sequences in them. Mm -hmm. And so this molecule can sort of like recognize that. Um, and when it sees that, will stop those from being made. Okay. But then there are other proteins that don't have that sequence in there that are just normal things that all of your healthy cells need to grow and, you know, be alive. So that's the biggest challenge is keeping us healthy and alive. Exactly. At the same time, right? Without, you know, killing the kid. You want to right. kill the cancer, you know, you kill the person. Then right. And so this is sort of a semi-specific way. You know, you're not looking for that particular point mutation yeah. like in KRAS, right? Like the G12C or something. But this is a way to try to hit a lot of those different oncoproteins mm -hmm. all at once. Um, and hopefully not hurt the other cells. Hopefully. Like yeah. Hopefully. Well, we're excited to see more about your research and what it is that you're yes, doing. Yes, thank you. Because so we know. Much. No, well, thank you for what it is that you're doing because you guys are making the difference. That's what I hope. No, we <laughs> hope. We know that you are. And even if it's not successful, Okay, like if right. this just doesn't pan out, right? The right, but it's thought, still another thing to it, cross off. It's, it's something that it doesn't try. work and something else that may work like later on. Yeah. So that's important too, because I know we don't always see published data on bad information, on, on what didn't work, right? We're, we're not seeing published data on what does work. And this we're celebrating, but it's an awful lot of learn lessons right. learned first. You know, it's kind of what Kayvon said with KRAS, that people are really trying to go through and try each of the different avenues. Yeah. And it turns out some of those just don't work, mm -hmm. but hopefully you're trying every single one of them to find those ones that do work. Yeah. Well, thank you. We'll keep, we'll yeah. keep doing what you're doing. Okay, come on. Right. Well, keep on coming. Hey, how are you? Hi. <laughs> I'm Jack. Hi, I'm Jack. doing all right. Yeah, you're doing all right? Yeah. Okay, um, what is it you're working on, Jack? So I'm a graduate student in the lab in the same year as Megan, and I don't work on KRAS. I work on a whole different disease, which is chronic myeloid leukemia, mm -hmm. the most common leukemia in adults. Uh, it About 10,000 people a year get it in this country. You might know somebody who has it. Mm -hmm. And CML, which is what we call it, is has had a ton of work done on it. People have already developed drugs that work quite well on CML. Most people who have CML 
um, will take a drug called imatinib and they will be fine for the rest of their lives. But uh, as is common in lots of types of cancers, uh, some people who take this drug will end up having resistance mutations in the oncogene that drives the cancer and their cancer will come back even though they're still taking the drug. And uh, in this case, people have actually already developed more drugs that work even on these resistance mutant cancers. Uh, the drug in particular that works the best on these cancers that have that uh, resistance mutations is called panatinib, but panatinib is relatively toxic for a cancer drug. Uh, it causes heart toxicity in some people. And my project is about developing a new drug to target chronic myeloid leukemia that will not have this toxicity problem. And the way we're doing that is by explaining the fact that the oncogene that drives CML uh, is called bcr able It's a kinase. Uh, and unlike KRAS, in which it was quite hard to find even one pocket, uh, bcr able has two pockets that we know about already. So it's this big kinase protein, and it has uh, one place for a drug to bind on one side and one place for a drug to bind on the other. In my project, I am trying to use uh, two different uh, inhibitors that we know bind these two pockets and to physically connect them together with a long chemical linker into a big two-ended dumbbell of a molecule that we hope will uh, bind BCR able, the oncogene that drives CML, better than it binds any of the other proteins that panatinib is binding when it causes this toxicity. And this is uh, pretty early, but we're making the molecules and some of them look kind of promising and we're hoping that they will work well as drugs, even though they're very large and floppy, which is unusual for drug well, When molecules. you say large and floppy, okay, yeah. I'm picturing elephant size, but yeah. that's not what you mean. Yes, I, that's <laughs> not what I mean. The, the drugs that I'm talking about are still extremely tiny, but um, the, so the, the drug that I'm talking, the, the molecules that I'm making that might someday turn into drugs, they're certainly not ready to go into people yet, uh, are about four or five or six times bigger than the drugs that you might normally take. So each little molecule is about four or five or six times bigger um, than say the drugs that target KRAS. Uh, and that usually means that they won't be good drugs. Uh, molecules that are too big have a hard time getting into cells and all the molecules that we're talking about have to get into cells in order to do anything. But it turns out that certain kinds of large molecules are still able to get into cells, even though 20 years ago, people might have bet you that they wouldn't. And we're just discovering this in the last 10 or 15 years. And so that there's lots of fresh stones to turn over now that we know that this is an approach worth trying. So it's made it onto the list of things that we want to try to cross off. Well, keep doing what you need to do because mm -hmm. resistance when it comes to drugs and having better quality of life, this is a patient problem. Yeah. And as a human condition, right, that we need to feel better. And um, so we can keep going. We'll keep doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and good luck as, as far you. as it's breaking out, right? And I appreciate you sharing what you've got going on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Hey. Hey. Thanks for I guess, coming and sharing with us. Well, yeah. Well, I haven't talked too much today, actually. So, like, you guys are lucky. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So, tell us your name and tell us what it is that you do here. Okay. So, my name's Josh. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a postdoc in the lab. I actually just joined like two weeks ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I'm relatively new and I'm, I'm learning a lot right now. <laughs> okay. Um, but the project I'll be kind of working on right now isn't. KRS specific, mm -hmm. um, but it's related to kind of another uh, pathway. Okay, what pathway is that? So it's the Wnt beta catenin pathway. Okay. And so it's so another... talk talk us through it. Oh, uh, it's kind of a little long, <laughs> okay. um, but uh, broadly, uh, the Wnt beta catenin pathway uh, regulates cell growth, mm -hmm. and it tends to be uh, a highly mutated pathway in cancer cells. Okay. And um, 
very generally how it works is there's a contription factor beta catenin um, which is kind of constantly being made but then also degraded by the cell mm -hmm. and it's only when you stop the degradation of beta catenin you get um, the activation of these genes which control cell growth and so um, you can get mutations in this pathway which essentially stop the degradation of beta catenin mm -hmm. and so kind of based on my reading um, not 100 an expert in it yet um, but yeah. medicinal chemistry companies, pharma companies have done a lot of work trying to regulate this pathway mm -hmm. to kind of turn back on the degradation of beta-catenin or inhibit um, its ability to control cell growth, but have had kind of rather a lack of success. Okay, and so do you do you have your, your project plan for the year? Um, maybe not like the year yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Working through it. But we have, I think, some immediate goals to kind okay. of try to see if um, our current action plan is going to be viable. Okay. So if it's viable, then, you know, that will kind of turn to your plan and we'll see. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, we're excited to see. And yeah, they, I, I guess you guys don't always get to get patients in here. So like, you know, now you have more motivation than <laughs> like later, right? Yeah. So yeah, well, yeah. well, good luck. And we can't wait to see more about what it is you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're still going to keep them coming. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, the lab is slightly smaller right now, but we, we have even more people coming. So, okay. All right. So, hi, everyone. Here's hi again. Uh, I'm Larry. I am, I guess I'm a fifth year grad student now. The time kind of flies. Um, I am an MD PhD student. So, what that means is I've done like the first part of medical school before I went to the PhD. And after I'm done with the PhD, I'll go back to medical school. So um, it's always nice to see uh, patients because I feel like that gives a lot of context to the research and you really feel the impact um, of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so wait, are your goals to be uh, become a, a doctor mm -hmm. in, in like early study sort of? You know, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm not sure about the specialty yet, but ideally I'd like to see patients and also do research at the same time. Okay. And hopefully those two things line up into the, the same field at least. Well, we hope so too. We yeah. hope so too. And so no particular area of interest right now. Um, I would say that oncology is very interesting. Um, it's it's there's there's several types of oncology so there's you know there's radiation oncology um i'm, I'm sure i don't need to explain this to, to <laughs> no not to people, most patients yeah, no, no, no. The people here, we can but... tell you about stuff yes, yes. <laughs> we have um, you stuff that make your hair fall out yeah literally yes <laughs> I'm, I'm sure of it. sorry but you know there's 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 several specialties and you know very broadly i mean i'm still interested in oncology so i need to figure that out but okay i cool. have time yeah. yeah you do have time we'll keep doing what it is that you're doing okay. and like you know we're here to kick cancers, whatever, yeah. Ras, right? Yep, yep. Okay, cool. All right. Well, right. thanks. Good to see you. And yep. did you want to tell us what you're doing? Yeah, sure, sure. Real quick. Um, so I am the Parkinson's disease project that okay. Kayvon, uh, I, that's what I've been working on. That's uh, what Kayvon mentioned earlier. And um, the gene that I'm working on is called leucine rich repeat kinase 2. So LRRK2, LRK2. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're interested in LRK2 is um it is one of the few genes that can actually cause hereditary parkinson's disease and hereditary parkinson's disease uh, parkinson's disease in itself is rare as a whole per, uh, percentage of all cases of parkinson's usually patients that have parkinson's uh, don't necessarily have a mutation that people uh, have found um and however what is interesting about lurk2 is that um we think that it may be involved uh, not only in these familial cases where people get Parkinson's disease, but it, there are possible variants that go undetected in patients that have the regular type of Parkinson's disease as well. So it's the hope that by studying uh, LERC2, we're able to understand how Parkinson's happens as a whole, uh, because right now we still don't have disease-modifying therapies uh, for Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease at all. Um, most of the treatments are aimed at controlling the symptoms and those uh, become ineffective over time. So um, where the interplay between LERC2 and Kayvon's lab kind of comes in is that LERC2 also has a GDPase domain. Mm -hmm. 
It is a huge protein. Um, I would say it is at least 10 times the size of KRAS um, approximately, but it also has a GTPase domain within it. Mm -hmm. And that GTPase domain is distantly related to all of the other GTPases that we talk about in this lab. And it has a similar fold. So the 3D structure is somewhat similar to KRAS. And we're interested in the question of whether or not uh, we're able to find a pocket in that a GTPase inside LERP2 that is also similar to the pocket that exists in KRAS. And while this might not be a drug, we're all, we, we want to make use of the existing molecules that have been targeting KRAS and put them into the LERP2 and see whether or not playing around with the LERP2's GTPase influences the overall function of the LERP2 kinase. Because if we can dissect the difference, uh, different functions between these two domains, the GTPase and the kinase, mm -hmm. both of which are part of the same protein, um, that would enable us to have a better understanding of what this protein is doing to cause Parkinson's disease and maybe even open up another avenue of therapy. Because drug companies are very interested in LERP2. They're making kinase inhibitors. Uh, but there are potential pitfalls with using kinase inhibitors. Um, and this is another alternative that we want to explore. Well, the drug companies may be funding it, but I assure you the patients really want it. So yeah, we're we're in this together and we're hope that you're we can see that you've got a lot of motivation and you're in it to win it. Thank you. So no, well, thank you for doing what it is you're doing. And like you need to keep going at it and taking these things and playing with them in a test tube. I mean, you know, well, or whatever, yes. okay, but but maybe before we go playing with it in people, right? right, you know? right. Maybe that's the whole point of the research, right? right? I'm, I'm glad everyone's here because, you know, um, you know, most of the time when you're in lab and you're just putting one clear liquid into another clear liquid, you're like, great. <laughs> not <laughs> but, the glamorous thing yeah. it looks like. Not, <laughs> not, not always, not always. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, this is this is always great to to have people come here and we we, we want to see, you know, um, how the research is doing. Well, and we want to encourage you all to participate in these these functions that we do with the kickers, okay? And we do the webinars, we do the conversations. We have like one meeting for sure a month. It's just patients and care partners, but you guys are invited to participate in these, okay? And so you are part of our community and we want you to be able to be part of that. When I talk about KRAS kickers, and I'm not gonna bore these folks with my story again, okay? KRAS is also an acronym for KRAS Knowledge Research Advocacy for Survivorship. I don't know if you know this, but you guys are part of that whole R community, okay? And so you're in the research part of it so that we can all get towards the survivorship, okay? So keep doing that because we do need it. Thank you. So thank you. Thank okay, you. Who, does you guys want, you guys are you? Right, Reeve. Okay. I've just, can, okay, I, please. I've just wrote a, a book uh, so, about Kiras. I can't see what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. Come sit, wrote, come sit. Okay, I, I can see. We're, we're just going to go through these folks here. And I can see, I got a couple of things blown up. Okay, tell us your name one more time. I'm so sorry. Hello, my name is Ching Hen. I'm a postdoc in k Bonds lab. Uh, I was trained as a organic chemist uh, at college and uh, who's supposed to do some toxic explosive works in the bunker. Um, let's you describe some of the image um, of scientists. <laughs> and however, uh, three months before I graduated from the college, um, one of my close family member uh, died of lung cancer that really um, encouraged me to pursue a slightly different uh, um, track in my in, in my scientific career. I switched to, to decided to pursue a biomedical uh, PhD uh, in La Jolla, California. And during my PhD, I developed um, radio pharmaceuticals for um, for patients that can be uh, diagnosed um, with uh, to to get early diagnosis of, of either cancers or um, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's or um, Alzheimer's. Now, really, that's really because um, the close family member um, that I uh, died from lung cancer um, was diagnosed at very terminal stage, and. Uh, she uh, didn't um, survive, I think, more than three months after diagnosis. And uh, that's 
that's uh, heartbreaking, heartbreaking for me. And uh, I later decided to, to join Kvon's lab because um, I know Kvon's very um, famous in 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 chemical biology, who also developed chemical tools to 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 drive oncal proteins. And but also because KRAS G12C is one of those major drivers for non-small cell lung cancer. And I think I probably can do something uh, to real lung cancer patients when I uh, joined KVON's lab. And I joined this lab about three years ago. Um, and uh, as I have some chemical background, KVON and I decided that we probably should uh, pursue the next letter on the KRAS mutation alphabet. Uh, which is KRAS G12B. That's what we are working on right now. Um, um, it has been very difficult in, in the first uh, two years. Actually, this lab has been working on G12B for almost one decade. Uh, not much success. Um, many patients might ask, um, there is just one letter difference, but why um, G12, why G12B is still undruggable while G12C patients Right now, have lumigrass and some also uh, some other lined up uh, therapeutic. Um, um, it's uh, the my my take will be um, it's it's relatively easy to find a gemstone in a forest, but it's really difficult to find a leaf in the forest because there are just uh, so many leaves in the in the forest, and targeting one single leaf in the forest can be really difficult. And the breakthrough, I would say it, it was a breakthrough, came, came along about one year ago. We first identi uh, identified a uh, small molecule that can uh, target uh, KRAS G12D, like Lumacras did to, uh, to KRAS G12C. However, that's still in the very early stage in, in test tube. But uh, I would say we are very hopeful and we are working full power trying to uh, push this uh, project forward. Right now, we have some promising data suggesting that um, some, some analogs or derivatives of that small molecule showed activities against KRAS G12D driven uh, cancer cell lines uh, in, in culture dish um, and uh, um, in. Um, in 2023, um, we are working, trying to push this even further, trying to get the drug into, in, into mouse and trying to uh, collect data there. And we'll see. What well, happens. I hope so. I'm a G12D yeah. patient myself. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, it's, you know, it's and the one letter difference is it, 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 it's huge. It's, it, it's, it's not it's not like it's like oh it's just next door it's I know, completely it's different that, <laughs> but that's really uh, making people frustrating and uh, yes I is. can totally understand that yeah it is so, and you know we're hopeful that what it is you've got yeah. is like um, going to be successful we hope so oh and, yeah we uh, do too <laughs> what we can guarantee that is that we are working really hard right now almost tirelessly. Uh, trying to push this forward and uh, getting this as quick as possible into first mouse, then uh, probably in in in, okay. in a couple of years into real patients. Okay. And why why is the G12D so much more difficult than the G12C? We found the pocket in G12C. Yes. And and I didn't mean to sound so dismissive about, but I mean it was a big deal. But I mean the G12D is what makes it harder. Okay. So. Um, chemically, C and D are very different. Um, in the alphabet, uh, C and D sit close to each other, but chemically they are really di uh, different. And um, one measure we we do for um, this kind of covalent inhibitor is the nucleophilicity. Nucleophilicity is something uh, measures the um, the affinity of a particular function group of a chemical entity to something is uh, electron deficient. So basically one chemical reaction is to couple two things, one being electron deficient, the other one is electron rich, couple them together, making a permanent bond in between. That's how uh, lumicrass and other G12C drugs work. 
and C is so they kind of magnetize each other so that they're connected. Of, yeah, there's one part. You, you can imagine there's one thing positive, another thing negative. They yeah. couple uh, with each other together. Yeah. Um. The thing is that C is highly nuclear velocity. You can imagine that's something a hundred. It's very difficult to say. Yeah. And for D, the nuclear velocity is maybe around ten ish. It's pretty close to water. Um. You, you know, the composition of human body is right. about 80% water plus 20% plus of everything else. And how can you uh, target something close to water, mm -hmm. um, but not targeting something else? Uh, it's very, it's, it's very difficult. It's like find, finding one leaf in the, finding one specific leaf in, in, the, in the forest. Or knowing it's, which one's going to fall first. Right. And what we, um, how how we found this molecule is that we first uh, find a um, um, small molecule entity that binds to the pocket really tightly. Mm -hmm. That's based on the work done in the in the pharmaceutical in several yeah. pharmaceutical companies. We we took uh, uh, we did some work on top of that. Another thing we did is we constantly it, uh, reiterate the process of selecting a um, chemical entity. That has higher reactivity to to D, and we couple them together. So it's something that we're going to be able to see when we see your lab. What is that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we do the lab for because you're. I'm sorry. Now it's a little bit too hypothetical for me. Oh uh, yeah. So like, yeah. So unless I have like a graphic or something, and you're going to kind of lose me a little bit. But I mean, it's like we're going to do the lab here. Yeah. So yeah. like maybe we could see something like a little bit more in action. So it's it's I, I need more of a Pac-Man sort of a visual here than than um. um yeah. Because I can understand that something would be difficult because of the viscosity, because of water and the water composition, it'd be difficult to attach to it. But maybe I like, made it too com complicated. No, uh, but I, I, the, I, I, the event I, I of the just... covalent drug uh, um, uh, effect is that it first binds into the pocket mm -hmm. of the target uh, of the protein of interest, which is KRAS G12D. Mm -hmm. Then it make a bond. Uh, with the protein itself. Okay. So there are two things we need to consider. One thing, how tight the small molecule bind to the pocket. The second thing is how fast the molecule is going to react with, with the uh, D residue on the on the KRAS G4D. So we uh, kind of leverage between these two compositions in this uh, event. Mm -hmm. And finally, we were able to uh, to select one compound that balanced between uh, first the tight binding and second, fast reaction. So now the compound is able to bind into the uh, pocket of KRAS G12D really fast, uh, really tight, and it reacts with uh, KRAS G12D at uh, the mutant uh, at the mutation position, which is D12, really fast. In in test tube, uh, we are able to label the protein um, to 100%, which is kill the activity of the protein within five minutes. That's that's way faster um, than any of the uh, G12C molecules we know right now. But I cannot guarantee that it's, this kind of fast kinetics could be 100% translated into uh, their vehicle index. Um, but we'll see uh, probably in a year or uh, maybe two years. Well, how, I how hope so. Work well. <laughs> I hope so. I hope it, I hope it um, works well enough. Quick enough that we can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And you certainly have a personal motivation. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your story. That's really motivated us. Oh, you guys have hardly even heard anything from me. You'll, you'll hear more, I promise. I'm not going to shut up. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank, thank you. I know people have questions in here too, so I'm not gonna, I don't need to get okay. short, but um oh hi everyone. Um my name is uh Wen Chi. I'm a fourth year graduate student here in Kmon's lab. Um nice to meet you all and I feel like really honored to be here and to talk about everything and to get more uh inspired and motivated by hearing all the stories that you share. Uh yeah, so it's quite convenient for me because my project is on the slides. Um <laughs> Uh, so we're gonna make it easy for you then. Uh, so as you may be able to see the cursor here, I'm the currently the only person working on the immune evasion project part of this, uh, the uh, to targeting cancer. Uh, so as Kayvon uh, previously described, like this 
process uh, has like multiple steps. Um, and it, like for biology system, if it has this many steps and then it can go wrong at any stage. Uh, but like for my project, I'm like focusing, uh, trying to like get this uh, process to work for like uh, to better detect cancer cells. Oh, wow. Nice. Okay. So now he's showing off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, now we're getting fancy graphics. So T cell is like here, uh, it's like the killer cell like in our immune system that if they detect that uh, our cell, there is something wrong, it will kill it. And for cancer cell, it has mutations. So uh, it will be like, if the T cell can detect this cell is cancer cell, it will be able to kill it. And then the decision making process is focusing here, which comes with this protein MHC and then the peptide with the mutation and then the T cell receptor on the T cell. Uh, so if this system works like perfectly, why patients still have cancer? The answer is like, this has many steps and didn't work perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, my project is trying to uh, make this process better uh, by using a small molecule. So as you can see here, there are lots of peptides. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So as you can see here, this process generates a lot of like squiggles, like the peptides, but like only a few of them have this red dot, which stands for mutation. Uh, and if we can use a small molecule, like shown here in this yellow pen. Pentagon, hexagon, uh, hexagon, uh, yellow hexagon, uh, to specifically identify or find this peptide with the red dot, with the mutation, and bring it to the cell surface for the T cell to see it. And then the T cell will know there's something wrong with this cell because of first, it has the mutation. Secondly, this small molecule will also create some alert signal to the T cell, and then T cell will recognize the cancer cell and kill it. And a great benefit for this approach is not limited to KRAS uh, only. It can work for other protein like the P53. And this mutation, we're trying to work on multiple mutation like KRAS G12C, KRAS G12D, C4 cysteine, D4 aspartate, and then um, and KRAS G12, basically. So would, that be, so would that be considered a pan KRAS? Uh, not this one molecule. So the complicity comes from this like um, molecule here, MHC on the cell surface. Mm -hmm. Each person has a very different composition and it can be like thousands of difference. So we won't be able to find one single molecule that works for uh, every mutation, but we're hoping to find molecules that for each uh, mutations. Okay, yeah, we hope so too. Well, we're excited about what it is that you're doing. And, you know, I, I'm going to try and speed through the last couple of people we've got. So, yeah. So, this is similar to uh, ADC antibody drug company. Uh, this is uh, not exactly like that. So, antibody is like floating around, and, uh, and this is using the uh, immune system itself. We're using the T cell, the T cell receptor. So, it will be like a complementary. Uh, Therapy together, they can use together as the ADC. The new stuff that's arriving is going to make an ADC for, for this part. So okay. instead of the T cell receptor, we're going to make an antibody and put a drug conjugate on it. And so this will mostly show like in a vaccine trial. You guys, we can't hear you on the video. Oh, sorry. 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 You guys can both come over here. No, I would like to hear the conversation. Okay. So, so join the conversation. There, there of, here, come uh, sit here so they can hear you the video. There are a lot of mRNA vaccine trials that are yes, similar to this concept. Yes. Right. I'm just trying to. So, so in, in those vaccine trials, people are getting immunized with yes. the genes that code for these differences. Okay. But one of the biggest hurdles is that uh, a lot of the patients, you know, MHCs will just not present. The peptide won't bind. Mm -hmm. So you get immunized with it. But you can't alert the immune system because there's a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. So what Wen Chi's project is to do is to help the correct peptide come up. Once it's on the surface, then we can use ADCs and everything. And the, the immunizations, it would be to generate T cells. So all of that part could be used. So 
is going to combine all exactly. these different yeah. technology into yes, yes, exactly. Very exactly, and a bottleneck that we think is yeah. Cool. So, so it's a bit of a layer. Is it similar to the HLA library of those targets? Uh -huh. yes. oh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The MHC in human is called HLA. It's a human uh, exactly. entity. Yes. Yeah. So. so this would be require a uh, you know a cancer genome sequencing to find the mutations the patient have, and then which six MHCs they have, and then we would give the right glue to bring the mutant up to the patient's MHC. Yeah, and getting tested for that, even in HLA, is an issue. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, like, That's the is... most diverse part of the immune system, most diverse part of the genome, so 19,000 or so different genes in the population. Yeah. Cool. Well, in, uh, in terms of health and equity, it's more common in African-Americans and the Asian Americans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like- Yeah, they're different pools, yeah. Yes, what pools. Place, I thought they had, um, they had some so tests that you could just get a hold of as far as being able to do the, it on- There's Paris, and then the NIH has a-, a Yeah, the NIH has just a HLA test. G12D. I, I don't- No, C. No, I don't, I don't, one don't of them, know. But- uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that would be the same test for what you're looking for, though. No, I think for HLA testing, that's a different. I, yeah. I think it's like uh, but those tests. Target. Yeah, those tests are available because there are people like they are like a, uh, allergic to certain drug treatment, and so they need to like get the HLA screening before giving the drug. But that's for autoimmune disease. That's a different disease. But it's doable to do the HLA screening to identify what HLA you have because it's very common because people have been like going to like transplant surgery or they need to do the match before giving the like organ to another person. That before that can be done, they need to do the HLA screening. So this. Uh, technology has been uh, but, but yours is sort of but mine is different yeah it's like trying to use a small molecule to bring the mutation containing peptide to the cell surface for immune cell to uh, recognize this cell is a cancer cell and then kill it okay cool well i'm excited about what you guys okay. have going on too All so right. thank like, you so yeah. much well thank you okay, okay. appreciate it is he gonna want to come up here too? Yeah, when she when she's done. Okay. All right. Hi everyone. I'm in a uh, postdoc in Kevon's lab, and uh, I've been working on the uh, antiviral project. Uh, okay. Yeah, a, a different project in KRS. Um, uh, the reason uh, why we are working on this project uh, is because like we are not prepared for the pandemic. No, we weren't prepared for the pandemic at all. And so you're going to get in front of the next one. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Um, like the uh, like we are uh, the current uh, antivirals we are mostly like using is targeting the viral protein for to prevent its replication. But our angle is slightly different. We are targeting the human protein mm -hmm. because uh, we know with this approach uh, we can target not just one virus. We are we can target uh, a wide panel of virus. So when the next pandemic hit, we're more prepared. So is that why you got into this? Yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> I mean, is, that, is that, that your reason you oh. were interested in it is because of the pandemic or was it just because oh. like you had I, I some was... other interest in virology? Oh, I was trained as a chemist before, okay. uh, like as a grad student, as a, a PhD, and uh, but I always want to develop drugs to, like, but like with just chemistry, like the knowledge itself, I'm not prepared. I need to know better, know more about the biologist part to help me develop a drug. But uh, so Kevin really open-mindedly accept me to his group so that I did uh, learn a lot through this process to become a better, to develop uh, better drugs. Yeah. This is people that are making a difference. <laughs> okay. Right. So, you know, we don't know exactly how you're changing the world, but you are like, you're figuring it out because like you're breaking it down and you're, and you're taking the time to identify it and look for it. Yeah. So, you know, you need to keep doing the stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah. And um, we're not really sure how it's going to play out. Right. But we don't know what we don't know until you take a look at it. 
So I, thank you for, for the work that is that you're doing. Thank you. And because it also speaks to me on a personal level, I also lost some of my loved family members, like when I grew up, not just cancer, also neurodegenerative disease. So I feel like as long as I can like make better drugs, then like fewer people have to go through the pain that I go well, through. Well, I, I mean, and that's part of it, right? We all have a human connection to it, you know, you know, and you know, the humanity of it is you've seen it and you feel the loss. And so it is personal. And so it makes it that much easier for you to kind of come in and do the things that you need to do. And, you know, you're still part of the kickers community. And so please like join us when you need to like, I don't know if you guys are seeing, I mean, I, I see these little notes up here and I'm going to read them to you guys later about like, you know, Dr., you know, about thank you for the amazing work. Um, all these different comments that you guys are getting, because this isn't, these aren't comments for me. These are comments for you guys. Okay. Um, the, the things that you guys are doing is making, giving us hope. It's based on reality. Okay. Um, from Quebec. I mean, we, we've got people from all, all over the world here, you know, Finland. Okay. Because I mean, these are, this is the things that are, are making difference. Okay. And so we appreciate what it is that you guys are doing. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. And we have one more like left and then, then we'll, we're going to get, do like a quick, like lab tour and hopefully we can see something that's like, oh, I don't know, some of the mysticism, break it down a little bit, a little bit. Um, so it's okay. Gonna, okay. So, all right. Not last. We've got dessert <laughs> here. <not> last. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm Patrick. Um, I just said earlier, I just joined two days ago in the lab. So, so what fresh. world? So you've saved the world already in two days. In two days. Okay. Um, I don't think so, but let's let's see what's what's gonna come next. Yeah. So before I came here, so I did a PhD in, in Zurich, Switzerland. Now I'm a postdoc in Kevin's lab. And before I, I came here, I worked on, on a different class of drugs that are actually light activatable. So um, what we are trying in, in our lab here now is, is to direct drugs to, to the cancer cells, right? The mm -hmm. G12C, like the mm -hmm. mutation specific drugs. But there's also other ways to, to use direction of, of a targeted ther therapy, and that could be lights, actually. Okay, so if you were to like be able to light up the cancer, yeah. would you then be able to find a way to better target it? That's 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 uh, one of like, the ideas. Kind of like, so. like a mini rad radiation on a cellular level? That's one of the ideas. Yeah. Okay, see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's also... Yeah. He must have done yeah. a good job explaining yeah. it. Two days, he's doing okay. Yeah. <laughs> So that's also a field that Johannes is, is involved in. So there's also some connection from, from our lab to this area. And what I'm trying to work on in, in this lab now is maybe go back to these uh, original slides. Okay, yeah, those are the slides there. Yeah, thanks. So, so Kevin mentioned these uh, tumor suppressors um, in the slide set, like TP53, that's tumor um, suppressor protein 53. Uh, which are kind of the protector of, of the cells. And um, I'm going to try and work on a different um, protein called retinoblastoma protein, which is also the culprit for um, childhood cancers, just as retinoblastoma, hence, hence the name, or osteoplastoma. Um, but it's also involved in lots of other cancers, and it's often downregulated um, in different uh, types of cancers. And it's involved in a different uh, um, cell signaling pathway with uh, cyclin-dependent kinases, but it's overall the regulator of cell growth. Mm -hmm. So it regulates the restriction point uh, as the cell progresses through the cell cycle and it needs to progress through the cell cycle for it to grow. And we are trying to find drugs that activate, reactivate the tumor suppressor in order to um, limit soy growth as in cancer. Well, it sounds like we need to, oh, I mean, after two days, we don't expect to be too far, but we'll be back next week. All right, so, okay, so without much more to do here, um, I'm going to actually, is it going to be easy enough for me to pull this to the lab? Carry the... I'm carrying my laptop. Yeah, okay. that's good. So, it, it, good. We're, yeah, so we're not going to do any, hopefully it's not going to be too Blair Witch Project looking, but um, <laughs> like, you know, no guarantees. We're, we're just kind of figuring this out on the fly here. Um, yeah, bring it with just in case I like lose I my connection though. Okay, um, so, so we've got it, yeah. So don't disconnect from the like the internet because okay. sure enough, you know, once that goes, we'll be in trouble. So okay. Sorry, right, we're, we're gonna um so you guys don't I'm just gonna follow you. Okay. Yeah. So 
Hopefully it's not June. It's probably mine. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to be wandering off and to go into the lab. And so, so we don't have too much like random noise. Maybe we might want to just like pause the video recording or I'm muted or something. Safety glasses. Yes. So, uh, so not okay. those, I'll but go. we'll get you some right now. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you guys what this, how glamorous this looks here. <laughs> okay. Like, it's, <laughs> this looks like, I don't know. You have to show us the clock where you sleep. Have you been to labs before? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought, well, yeah, but I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no, I spend the, the midnight 2 a.m. grind. <laughs> Sometimes it's just some people fall asleep on the floor. Yeah, that's, that's one. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you so much. And then I'm going to bring some, and then Chin Hang and when she can kind of tell you different parts. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay, he'll come. This way. Oh, you're good. Okay, okay. Okay, cool. All right. So, okay, here. so when, so just when you're. Here, you're muted. Okay. All right. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Now we're in the lab. Um, we're just seeing some like instruments that we're using like on a daily basis. Uh, so this one we're using to like separate uh, molecules like so uh, when we're making like compounds or drugs, it can be like a, a mixture. So we're trying to get like a pure compound by like, using this instrument to separate. Uh, and then those are like a balance here and then people are making buffer. Uh, all right. And then it's the same instrument and then it's more like a, Chemistry. Oh yeah, this is a fun chemistry here. We we have like a Josh just set up like a reaction where you can see there are some balloons on top of like the uh the glass. Uh I think he's doing like hydrogenation reaction, which means like uh it's a hydrogen inside the balloon, and then they are trying to add like a one H like uh just basically reduce the compound. Yes. Okay. We make, make you look at like what you see through a microscope sort of a thing. Microscope. We don't. <laughs> we do have a microscope okay. in the TC room. Yeah, we can. Um. Uh, okay. Let's see. Yeah. You can do that later. Yeah, but this is like where all the chemistry happens. Uh, where okay. the early member in the Shokal lab discovered the first compound that reacts with the uh, Keras G12C. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Uh, it's just a different uh, aisle with the different chemical hood. Uh, but now here we're seeing like the, the major, major instruments, uh, the mass spectrometry where they can uh, detect 
uh, the molecular weight of the compound. And also with this kind of instrument, we are able to to, to monitor the, the modification of KRAS C12C, G12D oncoproteins proteins with small molecules. And it also enables one of the uh, groundbreaking work of the first KRAS C12C inhibitor discovery. Make sure to miss out of the microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then we're going to walk to the another room that we have all the cells growing. Can um, see what the cells look like? Because it looks really cool. And when yeah. they get that ball work, when we get that sense of it's like, uh, like the Pac-Man eating thing, it's um, very common. Do you have cells? Okay. I don't, do you have cells? All the Let's see. Here is our tissue culture room. Okay, here is the tissue culture room uh, where we are working with all the cells. Uh, so what you are seeing right now is like a, a bio safety cabinet that like the there has UV light on it so that can keep the, everything like super clean inside so we don't want to get bacteria contamination with the cells. Uh, we have two of those cabinets, uh, and then we have a microscope that we can uh, use to see how the cells are growing, uh, whether they are like healthy uh, or they're happy. Because when cells are like have mutations or they're like stressed, they will change their morphology, like how they look under the microscope. We can briefly take a look. Uh, inside the incubators, we have different flasks right now growing all kinds of cancer cell lines that we will treat with our drugs uh, to kill them. And uh, yeah, this yeah, uh, the red thing you are you are observing within the flasks are the cell culture medium, uh, which has a lot of nutrients to to keep the cells happy. But once we treat them with the drug, uh, our our hope is to. To, to kill the cancer cells, like those cancer cells in patient bodies uh, with our drugs. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I think that's that's the major two, the two major area that we work you daily. Do have any sort of like cell lines or anything that you can show us how those like go in and you see like, where you can see it with the microscope? Oh, you know, do you have cells in there? That's only Microsoft. But like, does it have like a big enough screen that we could see? No, it? oh, it's only the only the lens. Okay. You know, um, maybe use your phone. That is doable. But it's okay. very okay. Difficult. Okay. Uh, your microscope. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Well, I think that we're kind of like we're. Shh. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Jeez, these people, you take them on the tour, okay? And they, they get, okay, so. We can go into that room for lunch. Okay, all right, so let's let's go over here. And they, they said they were showing us your little station that's going to end up in the Smithsonian about like, <laughs> okay, or is it the scientific like researcher spot? Let's go over there and you can kind of talk us through that like real quick on video and then we'll end this if, if that's okay, because sure. we're still live. Can we do that real quick? Back to the lab. Yeah, yeah. We'll be up back in that one sure. spot in the lab. And then we'll we'll be finishing up. Just kind of give you guys like a heads up. Hopefully we won't have too big of a nightmare as far as editing this poor lousy video. I'll be right there. Okay. I don't know where I'm going. So you have yeah. Understand. I just follow. So there's that. Eventually you end up. Okay. All right. So where we're heading over, was it over this way? I don't, I don't know what he wants to show you. I was going to show, this was the, the spot they're like, oh, this is where he would like did the discovery or for whatever the RAS for the KRAS pocket oh, was or whatever. Uh, probably the back corner, but yep. I am not. It was a corner. Allowed. Yeah. That's okay. Just so it gets like a little bit more set up. Then we kind of talk it through and then, yeah. Yeah, that looks right. Yeah. And then we can kind of talk it through. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll have them. Talk it through so we can get all right. Come on back here. All right. This is kind of laptop device. So okay. So why don't you talk us through like what this what this is here? So like, but you got to be on the screen too because otherwise okay. it's just okay. like we're looking at junk. We don't know what it is that we're looking at. Yeah. So Oops. okay. So you know th this is it, this is I think a good thing to look at uh, because it really um, these are the molecules that we are trying to make right now. 
and we make them in these uh, fume hoods because they use organic solvents and we don't want those to come into the lab and uh, damage people's lungs and do those things. So we, we do everything inside of the hood and we you see all these tubes. This has inert gas in it because a lot of the ways we put molecules together would be sensitive to air or water. So everything inside these glass uh, uh, round bottom flasks and these tubes are all dry from uh, the oxygen, uh, from air, and they're dry from, uh, there's no water. And we run the reactions in there. And then we go to the other places that when she showed you, and we run those reactions down columns, and they get separated. Uh, and then we put them in little tubes, and then we isolate them and, and characterize them. But these are sort of the, the actual molecules that are getting made. Uh, some of these were the early tries at um, uh, the G12D molecules. So these were the kind of things that we worked on uh, most recently, I would say in like 2020. Hey, yeah. So talk me through one. So this is, this is the sort of the top piece of sotorasib and adagrasib. And then instead of a double bond, which would allow the cysteine to attack, we put this little three-membered ring with a nitrogen, which is an xeridine. And that is where the aspartate, the much less reactive nucleophile, can attack. So this was just a part of the molecule. We have a little squiggly line, which would be the rest of it that binds in the drug pocket. And basically what we were looking for is a kind of a spring-loaded reaction. We want this reaction to happen only in the pocket. So when it binds to the pocket, it sort of compresses the spring, and then KRAS attacks it, and then it unloads. And so that's why it has been so hard. It took us more than a decade to find the right reaction. And so that's what we were we were talking about in the room. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Is there anything else like of a particular highlight that you think we can kind of like recognize here well or i mean this no. gives you an idea this each of these is a uh is a little tube that has a molecule in it at the bottom and it goes into a magnet called an nmr sort of like an mri machine right. but for small molecules oh. and then we measure that magnet tells us this proton, that proton, that proton, and we can then characterize it based on its chemical properties and where its frequency is, what the structure is. So it's one of the steps we use to tell us this structure is this structure. And where's that machine? That's down on the uh, first floor. That sounds like a big, expensive it's machine. It's a very big machine. It's like four of them in a lab that's twice the size of our whole lab okay. and it's double height because it has to be high yeah so okay wow so the machines are getting ha i must be having a hard time keeping up with the technology that we need to be able to know that technology is like matured mostly 25 years ago and it gets better and better but we those are like the go-to machines, but really? they've been, yeah, they, they get better, but we have other things that are like newer. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah okay. like microscopes cool. that actually see the structure of proteins, cryo-electron microscopy. Now, do you That's have any big... sort of cryo-electron microscopes? We have those downstairs on the would first we, floor. Is there anything, even if I don't have to do it? I don't think we anything? have access. We collaborate with people that have access okay. to that room. So, oh, so yeah, they maybe, don't look that amazing. Do yeah, 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 they just... They look like big towers. Okay. All right. Cool. Microscope. Okay. Cool. All right. Is there anything else that we need to see over here that might be of interest? Oh, yeah. Come back here. This okay. is this is good. I'm sorry about this, but this is what happens when you do things like yeah. live. We're just kind of trying to figure this out on the fly. So I think it's kind of cool. I mean, it's not what you really think it would look like. Where am I going? So I'll let Chin Hang explain this one because this is probably the most sophisticated instrument we have within our lab. It's and above your pay grade, is that what you're saying? Every, <laughs> everything's above my pay grade. <laughs> okay, so talk us through. Now remember, you're talking into me. Yeah, so LCMS is basically a ten tandem instrument that couples- What liquid. machine am I looking at? Yeah, um, <laughs> this, this big one, 
this big one is actually two part. Uh, this part is liquid chromatography, which effectively separating uh, a, a, a complex a complex of a kind of protein mixture or small molecule mixtures into different fractions, and different fractions will come out uh, from this uh, instrument uh, at different time point, so that they will be guided into this another very big instrument. Uh, it's pretty tall, maybe seven, eight uh, feet tall. Um, this this uh, fragment will go into the mass spectrometer um, and the will mass be... spectrometer. Yes. Okay, and what they does it do? they they measure the molecular weight of so this either the tells small you molecule. How, how much it weighs molecular? Right, weight. right. Either small molecule or larger molecules like proteins. Okay. So that we know either a uh, KRAS G12C protein has been covalently modified by our drug or not. Okay, and you can tell that based on the weight. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, for example, a uh, so typical... it's like weighing myself first and then weighing myself with that's the suitcase. it. That's it. It's okay. just uh, working on right. Okay. On I mean, I mean, a, I, I, a, I, I a... don't. I hate to dumb it down, but I mean, that's that's what you need to understand that's, it. Is that's, that right? That's, that's plain, uh, very plain language. I think very good explanation okay. of how we do it with it. Uh, it basically just measures really tiny uh, stuff, but with higher molecular weight. For example, a typical KRAS uh, protein has a molecular weight about 20 K Dalton, but 20 what? K Dalton. It's, K -Dalton. A, it's a measurement okay. of how big a, a molecule is. Okay. Uh, for a comparison, water molecule is about 18 Dalton. Okay. And KRAS molecule is a thousand fold larger than a single there water molecule. There goes the K Dalton. Right, K Dalton, that's K thousand. Kilo. Yeah, yeah, kilo, kilo, kilo Dalton. Dalton, okay. Right. And our drug molecule is about 500 to 1,000 okay. Dalton. So we can use this instrument to tell whether the KRAS protein has been modified by the small molecule drug or not, because there will be a 500 to 1,000 difference between the modified and un unmodified uh, proteins. Okay. Um, and also by the same instrument, um, or actually earlier version of this instrument, um, uh, people in this lab discovered the first uh, ligand uh, of KRAS G12C, mm -hmm. uh, which eventually um, evolved into the current FDA approved the Lumacras mm -hmm. to treat KRAS G12C mutant. And also, we use this same instrument, the current instrument, to, to find uh, the first um, covalent KRAS G12S, G12R, and now G12D inhibitors. And so, G12S, G12R, and, and G12D. Yes. Uh, inhibitors. Right, right. Right, right. And so, and that's how we're measuring it is based on the molecular weight that's because true. it's so teeny tiny. Right. That's the right. very first step of uh, identifying a KRAS inhibitor. That's just the saying that in test tubes, our a small molecule drug is able to, to, to make a chemical bond with the KRAS protein. Uh, that's step one. And step two, we have to go into the cell uh, tissue culturing room um, to treat the cells, cancer cells, with our drug to see whether those cancer cells have been killed or not okay. by, by the drug. Okay. Then we are going to push it to... So when you kill them, do, does it still weigh just as much or is it way less? Way less. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Usually, so, so, part, so you can tell an awful lot by the weight? Um, yes. The molecular weight. Uh, not, not, sound, not, not by the weight. Uh, just by, by the cell number. Okay. Because when the cancer cell were killed by the by the drugs, right. there will be much less um, in, in, in count of okay. uh, cancer cells mm -hmm. remaining in the in the country. Right, because you, you would be able to see if they're alive or dead, yeah, but yeah. you wouldn't be able because of whether they're moving or not, right? But you, what, do they weigh the same if they're dead or alive? Um, for the cells Is that itself, supposed to be a trick question? I don't uh, know the answer. <laughs> I, I, I do not have a way to measure the exact weight of a cell. Uh, what do we know? KRAS is way more inside. Yeah. Cells. What do we know is that KRAS proteins in the cell will get heavier with our drugs treated. Okay. Which means that in the cells, the drug molecule did the same thing as they did in the test tube. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. This is this is ter so yeah. ter This is great explanation. But you know, I want you to know that when the, everything in the lab is very sensitive, every piece of equipment can go down, and all of the students at my lab each are responsible for one piece of equipment. Oh wow! And so Chinheng is in charge of this one, and there's a nice example of 
how we all communicate. And maybe Chetang can explain this little, can you okay. show this cat? <laughs> okay, so, all right. So very high tech way of communicating with each other is, is your chem sample dilute and filter, okay? And so you want to tell, because you want to tell us, come over here so you can tell us like what that, what that means, okay? Because, because this I, instrument I can, I can is, totally make up my own rules. Because this instrument is very sensitive to, to even very tiny particles. For example, in your, in your samples, you have particles from the air, from something else, and they will just clock the column inside the, this instrument. And the whole instrument is going to, uh, to, 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 to break down and that will take Days, okay, so you're telling long. me that this is as complicated as my robot vacuum cleaner. I need to make sure I clean up my filter. Exactly. And exactly. that this is the exact yes. same thing. Okay. And so I, I'm uh, just seeing a little bit more glamorous stuff, right? right? Okay. But like, yeah. And again, I don't mean to be dumbing this down, but that's the way I understand stuff. That's okay. exactly how we work with this kind of okay. machine. Okay, yeah. great. And so like, as far as the dilute is concerned, um, diluted, right? Okay. Yeah. Do you have to use like um, distilled water? Is that what you're using? That's exactly. We have oh my gosh, what? distilled water, but it's actually uh, deionized so that we do not have any uh, inorganic salt okay. in that to contaminate our uh, samples. Okay. We want to keep everything in that, inside this big carboy to be pure water. Um, in other in other words, H two O right uh, by themselves. Right, but so so it wouldn't have like fluoride or chlorine or any of those other things. And, and it wouldn't be different in San Francisco than it would be in Europe or in China or in like East Coast or something, right? Yes, yeah. it's, it's, totally it's universal pure water. Yeah, okay. it'll be the same but pure water either. Is like what we see as a non-science person, yeah, it's like something as simple as that, which you're like, well, of course, well, I wouldn't have thought it through. Yeah. <laughs> okay, right. But this is something that makes a difference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then it's like, well, that is how you get something that's consistent. Yeah. So okay. Was anything else that we need to like okay, all right. I well, I don't know if y'all can see how amazing this place is. And um, we're gonna have to figure out a way that we can do like more road tours because yeah. the, the labs are like super fun. And okay, well, the truth is that the people are pretty amazing. Okay, <laughs> so like okay, I, I gotta say, like. I'm going to have to get better glasses, but um, they made me put these on. So, all right. Well, thank you guys for everything. And uh, thank you for thank bringing you us, uh, having us in. And we appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys. And we appreciate you Thanks, all that Mary, it is that you're doing. All of you. So, okay. Thanks for staying on so late. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, we have a good, good group of people. And thank you guys. We'll see Thanks. you all. Okay.